when you sever history from place, something's lost. We're crossing Third Street now. There's the Lovejoy. There's the Nugent. There's the Delicatessen. There's the Angel Flight Pharmacy. There's 301 that my grandmother turned into a rooming house. We're going to cross in a minute South Bunker Hill Avenue, which is the street I lived on. Right there, that's South Bunker Hill Avenue. Beautiful old building. What is it that's generating memory? It's usually things that were erased, half finished, spaces that were contested, the way something is occupied, the way the windows are dressed. But if you come to it after it's been destroyed, of course, you have only the traces that are left on the streets. And if the traces have been really leveled, you, you have this very peculiar relationship to it. You can't even believe what's happened. A few years ago, a thought occurred to me that uh, I was probably one of the last people in Los Angeles that not only remembered old Bunker Hill, but actually lived up there. Before too many more years pass, these memories will no longer be part of the living memory of Los Angeles. Sorry, not able to ride. Thank you. All the way out, please. Angel's Flight was an important piece of public transit. It's the way that all the people who lived up on top of Bunker Hill made their way downtown to go to work. I started riding Angel Flight in my mother's arms in 1946 and rode it right up until the time they dismantled it in 1969. For a kid, this was a great thrill ride because it looks like the cars are on a single track and are gonna hit head on. We're passing the other car now and it does miss by just inches. And you wave at all the people in the other car. Nobody there today. Originally, Bunker Hill was kind of the refuge of wealthy people. Subsequently, middle-class people, judges, doctors, built homes up there. Shortly after the turn of the 20th century, they built smaller homes, they built apartment houses up there. I found a newspaper clipping from 1906 advertising rooms for rent. Things changed, and the really rich people moved off of the hill. The castle, which is the building that my family owned, uh, was built in the 1880s, we think. And this photograph uh, dates from that time. My grandmother bought it in 1937. We owned it right up till 1964. At that time, that was about all that was left on the hill. This is the front doorknob of the castle. These are pieces that were salvaged from the fire that burned the castle down. I remember the sound of my footsteps going across the wooden porch, approaching the door. Lots of people think they moved houses from Bunker Hill or that some of the buildings still exist somehow. None of them do. There's nothing from Bunker Hill that was preserved. And they're so great. So great. It, erasure was a very, very important part of late 20th century modernist thinking. It, it allowed for more freeways, more roads. It took whole sections of the city and turned them into what seemed more functional. I can show you where the castle was. Straight ahead of us over here, up the stairs across Grand Avenue and the Wells Fargo food court there. There's a little building. That's where the castle sat. Only it was probably up about five or six stories because that's how much of the top of the hill they took off when they did the redevelopment. It's a figure ground ambiguity. You see a, a, 
an illustration of a wall and let's say the floor. And then for some reason, the line with the wall and the floor meet has been so erased. And for some reason, you can't take your eyes away from it because it's the thing that's missing. The absence makes a presence and it speaks to you. It tells you something about how the whole wall and the floor work together. So Bunker Hill is an absence that is a presence. And the language of that statement is potentially very humanizing. If something's truly absent, it's, it's also, as a void, very expressive. So the absence that Bunker Hill represents constantly haunts us. I can't hear it right now, but if we go a little bit faster, you'll hear the ring of the cable over these rollers that keeps the cable going in the right direction. There's, there it is. Uh, that's the, that's a, a sound that I associate with Angel's Flight, as well as the groaning of the wheels on the, on the rails. Brings back a lot of memories. We periodically do some test runs. If, if we're spending 30 or 40 minutes doing testing, we probably have 100 people we turn away. It's uh, extraordinary the number of people who want to ride Angel's Flight, and we just have to disappoint them. It's an important part of Los Angeles history. Uh, please don't uh, try to board the cars. We're just uh, doing testing. Please exit. Thank you. I'm sorry, but the car is not running now. The car is, I'm sorry, the car is not running. It isn't running. Now. It's not working now. I know everybody would like to ride it, but it's not running. I love this thing. It'll be a nice day when it gets running again, because everybody wants to ride it. Memory constantly, constantly is being erased and, and recovered and, and reconfigured. You might say it's almost Darwinian, it's constantly evolving. There is no point where the memory was pure. It becomes very interesting to see the city as a living, selected, and partial memory. There's one of our elderly neighbors walking down the street. When you generate a modernist, erased version of, of a city, when you actually tear it down, there's really no way to bring it back. So Bunker Hill is simply a, a series of photographs before it was torn down. What did all those old uh, pensioners used to do on Bunker Hill? Because they weren't working, right? They had uh, all kinds of time on their hands. They came down here to Pershing Square um, and sat and talked with each other. There was actually a speaker's corner over on that side over there in that corner, you know, like the speaker's corner in Hyde Park in London. We had a speaker's corner over here. Um, when I uh, was a kid, my great-grandmother lived up there on the salt box that my uncle Mickey owned. Um, and she had five sons and two daughters. Uh, every year, all of them would come back to Los Angeles to visit.